Lord, we thank you that we can gather together in the name of your Son. We thank you that he is here. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would draw us, draw us to yourself, that you would open our hearts and our minds to your presence, and that which you desire to do this morning as we gather together in your name. Make room in our hearts, Lord, for that which you want to impart. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It is wonderful to be with you this morning. It's great to be here. Uh, I've loved the music. Thank you for all of the contributions. They were just terrific. As, as many of you know, um, I heard the steel band for the first time at our Savior Palm Bay at their 50th anniversary, and I thought, how come I haven't heard them before? I just loved them, and I came up, and we were able to make arrangements for them to come, and they agreed to play at my consecration, so thank you very, very much for doing that. That was a real blessing to me, and to many of the other people who were there. Because this is a service that is saturated in music, which I like, by the way, um, I thought it would be important to look at the scriptures for today, particularly in the light of some of the things that we have sung. And we began, if you remember, by asking God, what did we say? We said, bless me, right? Do you remember that? Not your head. I like interactive. It's okay. Um, and so I thought it would be important, particularly, to talk about if, if God were to bless us, what would that look like? What would, that, what would that actually do? Or if we were to experience the presence of God in such a way that, as we sang, saturate my soul, what difference would that actually look like in our lives? Because believe me, when Jesus comes by His Spirit to do those very things, to pour out blessing and to, sac to saturate our soul, it's more than just a feeling or an experience. It's actually a redirected life. It's a changed life. There is the temptation, you see, in these kinds of services of worship for us to ask God to give a kind of spiritual experience to us, and yet we still act and talk just like we always do. And there's no change inside. I want you to know you can have an experience and not have your heart changed. Are you there? Yes. And so what we're talking about this morning is heart change, a different life. What happens if God actually breaks in and shifts us around and, as we sang, blesses us or saturates our soul? Because those things happen to us specifically for one reason, and for one reason only, and that is that God would make us more like himself. That's the proof of the pudding, as it were. It is a shifting of the heart, a change that God does inside of us, working in us things that we can never actually create for ourselves. I mean, that's the nature of a miracle. God doing something in our lives that we can never do on our own or for ourselves. And so what I want to do is look briefly at the Hebrews lesson and briefly at the Mark lesson, the epistle and the gospel this morning, exactly in that light. So look with me in your reading in Hebrews. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. Where is he? Do you know? What, where is, what are they talking about? Anybody? He's talking about heaven. In other words, what we're doing here, the, the geographic location of the passage is that Jesus in heaven, is in heaven. He is ascended into the presence of God. Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself. See, that's where he is. Now to appear in the presence of God, but why is he there? Look. He's there, what? On our behalf. So what's he doing? He stands before the very presence of God as high priest, 
presenting himself to God. And who's up there? A resurrected human body. Remember, Jesus is resurrected from the dead, and his body is changed. His body can go through walls, but his body still eats. It's recognizably human, but there is in fact a material difference in the resurrected body from a human body like we have. The resurrected body doesn't get sick. The resurrected body is not limited to time. It doesn't get older or younger. It just is. And is always, and it is fully alive. Remember, heaven is that place where there is no pain, where there is no grief, where God wipes away every tear from every eye. Sickness and disease are no more. War and conflict are no more. All stand in adoration before the presence of God. And Jesus is the one who is leading the way. And so a fully human, but fully resurrected human body is in heaven, standing before the presence of God, bearing in his body the very marks that nailed him to the cross. He is, when we see him, when we get there, we'll know who he is. We will recognize him. Just as we will also recognize others who have gone before us in Christ who we knew. There'll be a kind of homecoming when that happens. We'll run into people that we know. It will be wonderful. In that way. Here in this passage, though, the point that the author is making is that a fully resurrected human being, the second person of the Trinity, Christ the Son of God, is standing in the presence of God on our behalf. What does that mean? It means that there is a fully human resurrected body in the presence of God. And that means he knows everything about what's going on in my body. Did you hear me? And in your body. He knows what's going on in your thoughts. He knows, he knows what's going on in your physical condition. He knows exactly what's going on in your emotions. No matter what you might communicate or not communicate to somebody else, the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus knows everything about us. And that the very essence of what it means to be human is in the presence of God. So I can never go to the Trinity of, of God and I can look up and say, you have no idea what it's like down here. <laughs> no, no, just the opposite. He knows by experience everything about what it means to be human. And all of that humanity went with him into heaven itself. So what we don't have is some disembodied spirit who may have somehow forgotten what it was like to be the word made flesh incarnate. Just the opposite. We have in heaven itself someone who knows fully what it means to be human and stands there on our behalf as a resurrected human being. And to stand before the presence of God is code language in the New Testament for the fact that he is praying for us. So a fully human being who understands what it is to be fully human is standing before the presence of God on our behalf, which means he is praying for us, which means he knows everything about what you're doing, but he's also paying attention to what you're doing. It's not just that he knows your feeling and his th your thoughts. He knows exactly where you are. So when you're in the car going home today, guess what? Jesus knows. He knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're saying. He knows what you're not saying. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what happens to you. Now, but here's the thing. That should not scare you. For some people, it's like, oh my gosh. That means he saw me do that. <laughs> oh my gosh, he actually knows what I thought about so-and-so. <gasps> you know, I thought if I kept it inside, nobody would know. Oh yeah, he knows all of that. He knows all of it. But I, I want to say that to you as your encouragement, as an encouragement, not for fear of condemnation. Because you see, he knows everything about who you are, but what is he doing? He's standing before the presence of God on your behalf. So that means he's praying for you. In other words, we don't have to hide out from God. We don't have to pretend. In fact, we'll get to the gospel reading and we'll see Jesus really hates pretending. He hates it. That's a not too strong a word. So that when I come into the presence of God in prayer, what, what blesses me? I can be all that I am in His presence. And in fact, anything other than that puts me in the field of the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus condemns in the gospel. In 
In other words, you can come in here and you can look great and you can pretend to be well and how are you? Oh, well, I'm fine. And you can raise your hands in prayer and you can look like you're really Christian and really religious. But the fact of the matter is, is that if it's pretending, God has no interest in it whatsoever. You may be interested in the status that it gains you in the church. God has no interest in it whatsoever. It gains no status in the presence of God. Do you want God to bless you? One of the things that He will do is that He will literally open your heart. He will bore down into the very depths of who you are. Because there's no pretending with Him. If you want to meet the real Jesus, you have to show up with the real you. No pretending. But, if you're willing to be who you really are in His presence, and pour out your heart to Him, because He's the one who knows everything about who you are, that's when power can get released. That's when actual blessing can be imparted. Because if you're pretending, that pretension is literally a block between the depth of who you really are and the presence of God who wants to come in and change your heart and make you into a new person. So if you want to be religious and pretend, you can do that. But what's going to happen is you'll never change. Except that you'll get resentful. Because pretending is hard work. You'll get more and more dishonest. Because pretending is in fact dishonest. In other words, you won't flourish. You'll deteriorate. So if you want God to bless you, that means He'll want you to get real. Are you willing to get real? Then it is possible to be blessed. Do you want him to saturate your soul? That means what's in your soul? What can you present to God? Doesn't have to be clean and pretty. Just has to be you. And whatever it is, no matter what it is, he'll take it. He'll forgive you. He'll cleanse. Because you see, he came to intercede, which means he came to forgive. He came to change. He came to make things right inside. And not just inside, but also in our circumstances. Notice the end of the passage. He came, he will appear a second time not to deal with sin, because that's what the cross and the resurrection were all about, but to save those who eagerly wait for him. He's literally coming to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's coming to make all things right. And because that's the case, I can trust the fact that even though my circumstances may not be good, I can trust him to hold me in the palm of his hand, to get me through, because he's the Lord of those circumstances, and to give me what I need on the inside to be who he wants me to be, because I don't have to pretend in his presence. You want God to bless you? That's what we're talking about. And the gospel reading goes along with that, only it's a warning. Beware, he says, Ooh, pay attention in other words, of scribes who like to walk around in long robes. Hello? <laughs> What's he mean by that? He means, if I in any way think that the robes that I wear make me somehow better in the presence of God than anybody else here, I'm in big trouble. I'm in big trouble. Jesus has no interest in status. None. Which means he's no, he has very little interest, or no interest actually at all, in your status. In other words, if you're getting your well-being from the fact that you wear, what, a suit, or a policeman's uniform, or you name it, that's the long road that Jesus is talking about. If that somehow thinks it makes you better in the presence of God than someone else. Because you see, authority in the eyes of Jesus is not a place to feel better. It's in fact a place to serve. Remember, Jesus, before he was crucified, took off the robe, got down on his knees, and washed the feet of his disciples. And he said, I have given this to you as an example that you should wash one another's feet. That's what blesses God. When 
I use the position of authority that God has given me, whatever that might be, whether it's as a parent, whether that is as a co-worker or a boss, whether it is in the responsibility that God that I have, no matter how high or no, no matter how low, I am here because God has called me in that position to be a blessing, to serve and to give. I don't want to put myself in this position. I don't want to wind up being like one of these, oh, watch out for him, or watch out for her because she, she thinks she's really important. You know, we don't like people like that, do we? And there's a reason. And you know what? God doesn't like that kind of attitude either. He loves the human being. But he says, beware, that attitude's got to go. So that we can be there to serve. Now, we're going to be going into confirmation. Two things about confirmation that are important as it applies to this passage. They are going to come here and give themselves to Christ. And so the good news is that they can give themselves to Christ knowing that He knows everything about who they are. That they, that they don't have to pretend in His presence. That He receives them. And that He welcomes them. That He forgives them. That He loves them. And they're making a commitment to be His, which means they're making a commitment to serve. And wherever they are, to be servants. Not, I got confirmed today. <laughs> I got received today. The bishop prayed for me. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's, a, it's a place into which they've been invited. So that wherever they are, whether they be at home, or whether it be on their job, or whether it be out with friends, they're there, God, how can I serve you where I am right now? How can I serve you in my home? How can I serve you in my job? How can I serve you with my friends? So that literally, no matter wherever they are, they're servants. Because that's their calling. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. And that's the one that we are following. So, bless me, saturate my soul. What happens? Pour out who you really are in His presence, because that's where the blessing is. Be willing to serve, because that's where the blessing is. Don't be interested in status and pretense. God can't stand it. Don't allow that to happen in your life. Instead, do all that you can to be available to give and to love because that's where the blessing is. Let us pray again. Lord, in the midst of a world that is saturated with status, cars and houses and clothes and fashion, trends, electronics, relationships. Oh, so our world just races after all of these trophies, Lord. We come here as your people asking that you help make us servants. That you help us to discover what your purpose is for us. And that you would rid us of that need to have the status so that we can serve you wherever we are, whomever we're with. So God, when we say bless us and saturate us, we're really saying, Lord, make us like you. Make us like you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord,